All right, well, let's officially uh, call the party open. So uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us, uh, taking time tonight. I know we would prefer that we were all in person in the Papa Squad or uh, raising a glass uh, with each other, but uh, here we are on Zoom. So nice to see everyone's uh, face. And so my name is Greg Harlan. I'm the current uh, Introduction to Clinical Medicine Doctor, uh, Director. And as you know it, we like to call it ICM. Um, before we start, a couple of housekeeping um, items. So if you would like to put in the chat your, uh, where you're uh, visiting from or uh, your graduation year, and um, if you're an alum or a parent, uh, please let us know. Also, as uh, Molly mentioned, muting yourself when we're not talking so that uh, we can have optimal experience. And, um, and then finally, we will have some chance to do a question and answer later in the program. So please uh, save some questions. And then at the very end, we'll be open to have kind of an open social uh, half hour afterwards as well. So turn on your camera if you would like. And uh, we left it open so that it's a Zoom where you can see each other as well. So I'll give you a moment, I see the chat going. So feel free to let us know where you are uh, visiting from. All right, and welcome back, Dr. Reese. Yes, nice to see uh, many people who either I know your names or I know your faces. And thank you so much for, for joining us. So we have a great program uh, planned for tonight. Uh, we're gonna reminisce about the history of ICM and we'll have a panel discussion with three of our former directors. And we'll you know, just highlight again how ICM really puts the patient at the fore and teaching our young medical students to really be amazing Keck doctors. Um, so before we start, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Donna Elliott, who's our Vice Dean for Medical Education. Some of you may know her, but for those of you who don't, she is an alumna of the Keck School of Medicine. She's uh, in her role as the vice dean. She really oversees all of medical education, which includes ICM, uh, but there's a lot more to medical education, everything related to students and their academic performance. So that includes admissions, that includes student affairs, wellness, academic support, curriculum, diversity and inclusion. She's also the chair of our medical education department and that means that she's leading us now in curriculum renewal and curriculum development and everything around instructional design. So before we begin, uh, thank you very much for joining and please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Elliott. Thank you, Dr. Harlan, for the introduction. Um, it's a delight to be here with you all this evening and I'm grateful that you're all able to be here with us. 50 years is a long time. A lot has changed, but some things remain the same. For some things that have changed, in 1970, the cost of a gallon of gas was 36 cents and the average house price was $4,975. In 1970, Richard Nixon was president and the age of voting was lowered to 18. In 1970, the Boeing 747 made its first commercial passenger trip from New York to London. And in 1970, the then USC School of Medicine led the movement toward the use of the standardized patient for medical training with credit to Dr. Stephen Abramson. And officially, ICM was launched exposing medical students from the start of their education to the clinical side of medicine. Today, students begin supervised instruction with real patients from the very first weeks of medical school developing their clinical skills through simulated training in our state-of-the-art clinical skills center or on the wards. ICM is truly a hallmark, and some say the jewel of the now Keck School of Medicine of USC. That being said, like hundreds of medical schools across the nation, Keck has had to adjust to the practical and logistical challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite the COVID outbreak, our ICM groups continue to meet in person every other week to encounter hospitalized patients, primarily at the Keck Hospital of USC and the LA County USC Medical Center, 
in alternating and in alternating weeks receive instruction on the physical examination in our clinical skills center. Year one students are also using Zoom to learn interviewing skills using standardized patients with faculty member facilitation. We have transformed our teaching methods and launched a variety of new initiatives, including establishing successful distance learning practices to ensure safety and continuity in student achievement and clinical skills development. We've also developed online learning environments that promote interaction and small group activities and have expanded our use of technology to enhance anatomy and laboratory experiences. Thank you again for joining us this evening and I know you will all enjoy the program. But first, let's take a quick trip down memory lane to present day. Dr. Crispin, please start the slideshow.
Thank you, Dr. Crispin. Thank you, Dr. Elliott. It's really fun to see the slides and see many of our familiar faces and how far we have come. Today, we have uh, three of our former ICM program directors here, and we're gonna have a panel in just a moment. Before we do that, I thought I would tell you a little bit about the history of ICM. So we have many parents on the line and many alumni, uh, some students as well and staff members. But really ICM began in 1958, but it wasn't called ICM. So ICM officially started in 1969, graduating in 1970. So our 50th year now, but before that, in 1958, there was a kind of kernel of a program called the Doctor-Patient Relationship Program. And while it included many of the <laughs> curricular parts that we include now in ICM, it was really Dr. Barbara Korsh and Lauren Stevens who founded ICM in 1970. In a 1974 abstract, Dr. Stevens shared that students have surreal perceptions of their responsibility for patients and the recognition of unconscious motivation may be troubling to students. So in order to optimize the student's personal and professional functioning, the medical training should deal with these concerns and support could be found in small continuing learning groups for students and clinical faculty, which is exactly what we still have today. We still use things like videotapes of patient-student encounters, and clinical examples are discussed in the context of how do you provide the most comprehensive clinical care. Douglas Ford was an alumnus of the, Keck's, or the USC School of Medicine, which then became Keck much later, and he was instrumental in the founding of the ICM program. This was a radical departure from medical school at that time. Most medical schools really focused on the first two years of basic science, and then the second two years were clinical care. But Dr. Ford, who wrote a book in 1996 called Interviewing in Patient Care, he also taught ICM every Tuesday morning for four hours for 33 years, 1969 to 2002. And then once launched, as many of you know, the ICM program really has taken off and nearly every medical school now has a program like that but we're still at the forefront of uh, early access to patients for our medical students. And today, even though it's taught still in the first two years of the curriculum, it's still patient-centered and everyone is respectful and responsive to patient-centered care. And the ICM in the future, when you start to think about it, it may involve more use of iPhones, virtual interviews, medical simulations, maybe even physical exams done remotely and electronic health records, of course but there's still going to be those things that we teach and hold dear, like continuing to hold the patient's hand at their bedside or crying with them at the bedside as you share bad news. What about laughing with a colleague, learning ways as a first year medical student to introduce yourself to a patient, things that seem very simple, but are so important. And then we help them identify their own interviewing style. So patient-centered care is still woven into ICM today. So let's meet some of our previous uh, ICM directors. So we have Dr. Maureen Strom, who is the ICM director from 1990 to 1995. She is currently in Las Vegas and is a family medicine specialist. She graduated from Georgetown School of Medicine. And Dr. Schaff, Pam Schaff, is an associate professor of medical education. She's in family medicine and trained in pediatrics. She's also the director of the HEAL program, which is our humanities, ethics, art, and law program. This year, she also launched Keck's Masters in Narrative Medicine, which is a novel program. Pam was the ICM director from 1996 to 2007. She is featured here. And then Dr. Terry Worley, who immediately preceded me, was the ICM director from 2008 to 2014. She's a family medicine specialist is over 40 years of practice and graduated from UCLA Medical School. So let's start with Dr. Strom, and I think we'll go from Dr. Strom to Dr. Schaff to Dr. Worley. So Dr. Strom, what would you say first is maybe sharing one of your favorite memories of ICM? Thank you, Dr. Harlan. It was wonderful to see that slideshow, see so many uh, wonderful faces and, and brings back a lot of memories. For me, it's it's a delight to reflect on those early years, but I have to say, I don't have one specific favorite memory. 
but it was stepping into that remarkable history, the stepping right into the hospital from the first week of class, uh, preparing students to build their doctor-patient relationship skills at the same time as exploring those feelings and emotions triggered by the encounter or even by that sense of, I don't deserve to be here. I don't have a right to talk to these patients. Uh, ICM was that pioneer in medical education back then. I came from one of the schools that at that time had no interviewing program. So uh, I felt like I was learning right along with the students. So sitting with them during their interviews, watching that aha moment unfold when they would connect with the patient around an important issue, that was the, the greatest treasure for me. Uh, whether that be the clinical story of their illness or the deeply personal impact that had on them or their family. Uh, and the small group debriefing sessions afterwards to bring those learning points home when they struggled with those feelings. I have to say one memorable group discussion back in those early years focused on the cynicism of House of God scenarios and countering the student's assumption that they too would become so jaded as promised uh, in House of God. And I really felt that ICM was the antidote um, and the preventive therapy for House of God. By the time I became director in 1995, ICM, as you know, was well established. It was 25 years in operation um, under the leadership of Dr. Helen Kornreich and, the, and still many members of the inaugural faculty team. Dr. Kornreich's vision and guidance over her 20 years leading ICM, along with the, the original ICM faculty that you acknowledged earlier, created such a firm foundation that it, it can't be captured anywhere else. In particular, she was a fierce advocate for students in their ICM learning as the biopsychosocial process. And I have to say that was first presented by George Engel in 1997 at the first Lawrence Stevens lectureship. So it was this focus on the ICM interview format, open-ended, person-centered interview style, allowing the student to learn more about the patient as a person with the disease while they develop their own interpersonal doctoring skills. And so to be part of that process of personal and professional growth as they develop skills as empathic listeners was by far the best part of ICM. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schaff, what about you? Oh, um, so much of what Maureen says um, rings uh, so true for me as well. I couldn't think of one memory, so I came up with three. Um, and I think I'll start with the one um, that just, I think, reminds me of why this work is so important and why ICM is such a, um, a leader in this area. Um, I taught at Children's Hospital, my first group, um, when I began teaching at Helen Kornreich's Invitation. I took my group to Children's Hospital where I had trained. And one morning, um, our, a student who I was observing, I think I wasn't observing, I think the student came to talk to me about his encounter and told me that he was uh, very troubled by the mother's guilt about her child's illness. And his suspicion was that um, she was feeling guilt for no reason. What she felt responsible for, for was out of her control. It had nothing to do with anything she had done. And so um, the student and I found the, um, the patient's physician and were able to convey this story. And it was one of those moments where, you know, I could, I could show to the student, and, and this was a lesson learned over and over again, that our students who are in their very early days um, <clears throat> contribute to the care of their patients in ways they have no idea um, that they're even doing. So that's one of my memories that got repeated many times. Um, another was um, just the joy of watching student groups um, learn and grow together. Um, when a group gelled and, um, and came together and supported each other in this very profound journey as part of their becoming doctors was just such a joy as a teacher. And like Maureen, I felt I was learning right with them. And Tuesday was without a doubt my favorite day of the week. And I knew I went back to my own practice, a better doctor because of the time I'd spent with my students. And finally, um, I had the opportunity to know Peter Lee, who was uh, one of the founding faculty members in ICM, the chair of the Department of Family Medicine. And one day he stopped into my office. He'd frequently come by when he was on campus. And I was in the midst of a crazy, crazy time. And I said, you know what? I'm not gonna be too busy to have this conversation. So we sat and talked probably for an hour 
talked about ICM, about medical students, about medical education, about novels, of course. Um, and I, he was a reminder, he reminded me of uh, the other aspect of the joy of, of this work, which is um, seeing where you've come from, seeing where you're going and um, appreciating all of your colleagues and students along the way. So those are my memories. Oh, so wonderful. Dr. Worley, would you like to share? Forgot to unmute. <laughs> um, <laughs> now you can hear me. You know, it, it's so amazing to listen to Dr. Strom and Dr. Schaff, who I know very well and love dearly. And it's so much that we did not talk ahead of time about the specifics of what we were going to share, but it's so similar. So as director, as you know, uh, Dr. Harlan and, and everyone will appreciate as an administrator, there's so much that goes on in your life and so much that you're doing. But what is memorable and what is the favorite piece? That's the students. And it was certainly that way for me. Um, as, as Dr. Strom said, um, that, that aha moment that you can witness in these very early learners of, oh my gosh, this is my privilege to be talking to and hearing my patient's stories and my responsibility as well. And it can be really overwhelming to the early um, learners, uh, to all of us, you know, daily that occurred to me throughout my career. I remember one, as an example, I remember one instance in particular, although there were so many countless numbers, a student who um, first year was interviewing a patient and taking their very detailed um, ICM history, which hopefully they will have a chance again in the future to do, but they were very careful with it and discovered at the time that the patient was admitted for an acute and self-limited problem, probably appendicitis. I don't even remember the patient's presenting problem, but disclosed to the student a serious illness, a serious problem. And so we were able to go to the uh, primary care team that was taking care of her and discuss this with them and really get her plugged into the care she needed. And this really, the student was just amazed that he, as a first year student, just by listening to his patient could have such an impact on the outcome of her care. So that was probably the most salient piece that I wanted to relate as my favorite. Wonderful. Yeah, and so many joyous memories. And I see the chat and people who have trained under the people we mentioned, Helen Kornreich and uh, Peter Lee and yeah, just amazing uh, lineage. So what about some of the less rosy moments as an ICM director? Maybe Dr. Strom will let you start again. What would you say are the big hurdles? We can't hear you, um, Dr. Strom, you're muted. <laughs> okay, well, that's one hurdle is technology. <laughs> um, so I have to say based on the strong beginnings in history of ICM, the most difficult hurdle came with the need for change. You know, it, periodically, as you all have experienced, and probably in each of our periods of time as directors, uh, the curriculum was undergoing revision. So at that time, our it was our faculty discussions that became the crucible for our ICM change process, and the ICM faculty that became my support group in facing these challenges uh, that we had to um, go through. Our mandate was to decrease the small group time from twice a week, it was every Tuesday morning and every Thursday afternoon to once a week for the core ICM group. And we faced the challenge to introduce formal medical history taking in order to better prepare students for second year ICM because of its focus on the formal HMP and physical diagnosis. And that was a fundamental shift for many of us on ICM faculty at that time, particularly challenging for the inaugural faculty whose vision and passion for the ICM program was founded on a very open-ended uh, interview style. How would we preserve the intensity of the interpersonal interviewing and learning 
while still helping our students build the more clinical skills of the comprehensive history. Um, so as a faculty group, we struggled with this shift and sought to promote preserved unique aspects. By that time, Dr. Eric Cohen had already introduced standardized patients for teaching physical exam skills in year two. And it was during my first year as director that we began to work with and develop a series of standardized workshops for teaching the interviewing side uh, on those Thursday afternoons, which became workshops for larger groups. So that the, many of those cases which we developed then came from faculty. They were actual patients who had been seen by the faculty. And I remember in particular one that was Peter Lee's patient. And uh, I believe she is still used in, in ICM teaching in year one as a young woman, a teacher who has abdominal pain. Uh, and really it's more about her depression and her demeanor. So I see Dr. Harlan nodding. So perhaps Louise is still yes. uh, <laughs> teaching files. Very much so. So uh, it, it was that, that balancing that need to increase the, the structure in our teaching the interview while we still honor the biopsychosocial foundation that to me was the biggest hurdle. And I have to say the ICM faculty helped, helped us get through that time. Great, how about you, Dr. Schaff? What was the big hurdle for you? So as I remember it, I, think I tried to think of, okay, what was the, the tough part of my job? Because I usually just felt like it was, you know, I was the luckiest person in the world to have that job. Um, but I would say that the biggest challenge was in the realm of um, dealing with the budgetary constraints of a medical school and a healthcare, you know, academic healthcare enterprise. And so I felt that I spent a lot of time um, advocating and doing whatever I could to just um, make sure we could do the best we could by our students. And so whether that was um, advocating, being annoying, being the little dog yapping at the heels of, you know, one administrator or another to, um, to beg and plead and say, this deserves our attention, this deserves our investment. So I think that was, that was a challenge, um, ongoing part of, part of our lives, but, um, but worth the fight. And Dr. Worley? Okay, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would say all of the above as well. But for me, um, the biggest hurdle was uh, a problem of resources. And I don't mean financial resources, although that of course is always a problem. But at the time there was a lot of things going on in medicine and in medical education in particular. Uh, so, for example, the, um, the hospital moved from the big old county hospital to the smaller, gorgeous, wonderful for patients. And it also presented um, a, a challenge to ICM because there were fewer patients. And medicine in general was changing so that sicker patients were being admitted to the hospital and the stays were shorter. So people were more acutely ill, and it made it a little bit more challenging to find appropriate uh, patients for the students. Uh, at the same time, faculty, both full-time faculty, as well as um, our voluntary faculty, were having increased pressures to uh, be in the clinic and to decrease their teaching time at the same time that our class size was increasing. So these three things put together um, made the resources of finding patients as well as finding faculty um, a challenge. Fortunately, we were able to access other hospital, other clinical locations and, uh, and improve that as well. And through a lot of help from Keck, um, and I can particularly call out Children's Hospital, uh, we also were, um, were given more faculty, more faculty time for teaching. Um, and all of those really helped with that hurdle. Yeah, so wonderful. <laughs> wonderful to hear some of that historical part of really how standardized patient interviews started and how our, maybe our expansion, more collaboration with Keck as well as with children uh, really looks a lot more like the ICM that we know today. Great, so I'll, for our last kind of question, maybe in a brief way, what would be some pearls of wisdom that you each would give to ICM uh, instructors today? 
Dr. Strom. We'll give you the uh, kind of one minute uh, summary. Okay, well, I would say keep your students rooted in their quest for knowledge through their personal and professional growth so that they keep the needs of their patients ahead of their own and seek to understand the patient's goals and obstacles to their health through their active listening skills. And as you apply that active empathic listening with your students, I'd like to paraphrase Dr. Francis Peabody. The secret of the care of the student is caring for the student. We're all in this together. Thank you. Wonderful. Dr. Schaff. Uh, so um, I think what I'm thinking about right now is just how much change there is. Um, we have the change of a new curriculum. We have the um, major disruption of the pandemic. And I think um, that I would say to faculty, um, your modeling of your passion um, for teaching, for patient care means the world to our students. Um, you'll inspire them and steady them. And I think um, it's important to let them see your humanity, your vulnerability. Um, this is hard for all of us and it's a journey we can navigate together. And um, there's, there's no you know, more noble work, I think. And, and um, to be a teacher and to know that you're um, changing the lives of, of the future of our profession. Um, it's, it's just really um, something to embrace and, and hold dear. Thank you. And Dr. Worley, your advice? Well, I'll take a, a clue from um, William Osler, who said, we all love to, part, to impart the pearl of um, if, you know, listen to your patient, he's telling you the diagnosis. And that still holds true. And in terms of teaching, I would say, listen to your students because they can tell you how they need to learn. When, um, when I was a director, the big faculty controversy, not just in ICM faculty, but in the school as a whole, is should the students be allowed to view their lectures via video? And so now that sounds comical because in the time of COVID, but um, the students will find their way. And so have faith in the students. Yes, and we do have wonderful students. <laughs> too. Well, thank you, all three of you, for uh, taking time and kind of thinking back on your tenure as director and really where we've come. And um, we're going to transition to hear from uh, one of our recent graduates um, who is currently practicing at the Keck School of Medicine. So this is going to be the Lauren Stevens lectureship given by Dr. Joshua Sapkin. And Dr. Sapkin is an assistant professor of clinical medicine. He's also one of the associate program directors of internal medicine. He has spent a lot of time here as I saw that he was a medical student here and then did his residency at the county hospital and has stayed on as a faculty member. And you know, Dr. Sapkin really loves uh, teaching residents. He's won numerous teaching awards. And really we had asked him to let us know how has ICM influenced his uh, career. So we look forward to hearing from him and then after his remarks we'll open it up for some uh, questions as well. Dr. Sapkin. Thank you Greg. It's really an honor to speak at this event attended by so many individuals I admire and respect. Um, I don't know most of the people here but I know the work you've done and have great admiration for your dedication and commitment. And I've seen the fruits of your hard work. Um, currently, I've been on the ward now for three weeks and uh, it's just been awesome working with the medical students. Uh, as you can probably imagine, ICM has a special place in my heart for many reasons. It provided the foundation for my clinical practice that is virtually unchanged for the past 22 years. Although I'd like to think that my clinical skills have improved a little bit over this period of time. So Jean-Baptiste Carr said, the more things change, the more they stay the same. I have appropriated that phrase to the practice of medicine over the past two decades. Technological advances in imaging, diagnostic blood tests, and let's not forget the electronic medical record have changed the way we practice and interact with patients. 
The EMR is supposed to capture the patient's current histories, medications, prior surgeries, etc. It's a great tool if it were maintained properly by everyone who has access to it. Unfortunately, the EMR is often what I call the ERM. That's the electronic repository of misinformation. And, you, and we now have blood tests to tell if our patients have heart failure, bacterial, or even fungal infections. And you're often hard pressed to find patients who get admitted through the ER that haven't been imaged from head to toe with CT imaging, i.e. the pan scan. While this is a gross exaggeration, I think you get the point. Very frequently, the results of these diagnostic tests muddy the picture and mean very little unless examined in the context of the patient's history and physical exam. I, rem I remember being told during my first day of ICM that there is nothing more important than the history and physical exam when it comes to evaluating and treating patients. I also remember hearing, if you listen clearly and ask the right questions, the patients will tell you his or her diagnosis. And lastly, 90% of your diagnoses can be obtained from the history and physical exam. This has been my modus operandi since then. ICM was my boot camp whereby my fellow classmates and I would repeatedly practice various parts of the physical exam on each other. In the beginning, my percussion skills were non-existent and my ability to auscultate a murmur with an intensity of less than four over six was hit or miss. We were encouraged to be persistent and share the ward and bed number of patients with significant exam findings so we could auscultate murmurs, abnormal lung sounds, and palpate and large organs to name a few. I'm happy to say that my percussion skills have improved by leaps and bounds. And just last week when I started percussing on a patient's chest, the medical student asked me, wow, how did you do that? ICM also exposed me to the human condition. After talking to patients on the ward at LA County UC Medical Center, our team would meet for debriefing sessions to discuss the individuals we had met. We were reminded that patients are not their diseases, but rather individuals with diseases. We were informed that not only can patients learn from their physicians, but there are also times when physicians can learn from their patients, such as weak, unique ways of coping with chronic pain, staying optimistic in the face of severe adversity, finding simple pleasures during a long hospital stay. We tended, we tried to share these helpful tips with other patients, and I continue to do that today. We shared insightful pieces of literature with each other from time to time. I remember the impact of Tolstoy's novella, The Death of Ivan Ilyich, had on me. After finishing the novella, I realized that validating the individual's circumstance and displaying compassion are just as important as curing diseases. This is particularly pertinent when dealing with patients who have chronic progressive debilitating diseases. After seeing a woman with scleroderma and interstitial lung disease on four liters of oxygen, she ended the session by saying, when shall I make a follow-up appointment? I said, six months should be fine. Can I make it three? I know you're not prescribing anything for me, but I feel better after talking to you. Shortly after I joined the practice in July of 2001, that's the academic practice in internal medicine at USC, Ed Crandall, the department chair, informed me that one of his friends, or it might've been one of his colleagues, was developing a computer program that was designed to develop a working differential diagnosis based on a series of questions answered by the patient. These questionnaires would be delivered to patients by email and they would fill them out before they ever even saw me. And these were only patients with new medical uh, complaints that were allowed to participate. I was a little skeptical of participating in this pilot project. Was I going to help to create the next physician version of IBM's Deep Blue that would eventually put me out of business? After all, computers had virtually made car mechanics merely technicians for late model cars. But humans aren't machines. The patients found the long questionnaires tedious and rarely completed them. And for the ones who did complete them, and it, they said it took them well over an hour, 
the differential diagnoses were rather long and unhelpful. I merely continued to take my medical histories the way I was taught in ICM with attention to detail. I remember hearing, try to get into the shoes of the patient and imagine what it was like for them. Write the HPIs if you were telling a story that flows chronologically and unravels in a logical manner. Capture your audience's attention and make convincing arguments for your working diagnosis or differential diagnosis. Resolve any inconsistencies beforehand and leave out extraneous information. Don't worry if all the pieces of the puzzle don't fit together. This is not surgery where things are more black and white. In medicine, we have to be comfortable working in the gray zone. I followed those recommendations and spent extra time when it came to the social history. As one ICM instructor told me once, if things don't fit together, the answer is likely in the social history. Instead of merely inquiring about their tobacco, alcohol, and drug use, I took a deeper dive and inquired about occupations, relationships, sexual history, hobbies, future goals, psychosocial stressors, hopes and dreams of the patient. I've encouraged the medical students and residents working with me on the medicine wards to take the same approach and have seen it pay off time and time again. For example, in 2003, our team was assigned a patient, a 64 year old man admitted through the Department of Emergency Medicine with sepsis secondary to meningitis. The usual studies were sent off and the patient was receiving ceftriaxone and vancomycin for empiric treatment of bacterial etiologies since he had a CSF uh, white count of about 465% neutrophils. Not entirely consistent with bacterial meningitis, but enough to raise concern. I assigned the patient to the third year medical student on the team and told her we would probably have to complete the entire course of vancomycin and ceftriaxone until the viral culture, unless the viral culture was positive. After spending about an hour with the patient, she returned and said, you're not gonna believe this, but Mr. X was visiting his brother in El Paso, Texas last week. You mean where there's a current outbreak of West Nile virus, I added? That's correct. She said later, called the lab, had the West Nile virus IgM added on to the CSF previously taken. And of course she was right, it was positive. No one but her had elicited that history or even thought about asking the patient where he had visited his brother the week prior. After feeling like I had sufficiently honed my skills in taking a thorough history and physical, I strove to find a clinical style that felt natural, was palatable to patients and achieved results. I benefited in this regard from working with Kendra Gorlitsky at the Clinica Romero on Alvarado Street. I admired her positive attitude, friendly demeanor, and ability to have frank discussions with her patients. Her ability to be compassionate yet firm with her recommendations in a way that came off as nothing but caring was truly unique. She set high expectations for her patients in a manner that empowered them to achieve their healthcare goals. Since then, I've striven to emulate this style of practice and have found it effective in achieving healthcare outcomes. Be it at the academic practice at Keck or the resident clinic at LA County USC Medical Center, one of my main goals is to educate patients about their healthcare goals and discuss different options to achieve these goals. To me, this is at the heart of patient-centered care because patients cannot make informed decisions with the appropriate education about the conditions affecting them and the risk and benefits of the different choices to treat them. Tailoring the content and delivery style according to patients' medical literacy, personality, and insight is an art form that comes with years of practice. I enjoy practicing patient-centered care, especially when patients are willing to participate and are eager for knowledge to empower them. I also remain open to suggestion from patients and even, even shared some of their observations and advice with other patients. I will, encourage the res I will continue to encourage the residents working with me in clinic to adopt this approach as well. I wanna take this time to recognize the dedication, incredible work that has been done and continues to be done by the past and present ICM instructors. In the summer of 1993, I was a first year medical student at USC hanging out in the Papa's Quad when I spotted a group of six students surrounding a tall, golden tanned physician 
with well-defined facial features and a perfectly combed head of hair. He looked like he could be an actor or have his own doctor show. The body language, facial expressions, and laughter were that of a rock star surrounded by his fans. The students eventually dispersed and one came walking my way. Who, who was that man, I asked? That's Dr. Cohen. If you're lucky, you'll get assigned to his group next year. He's amazing. Since then, I've talked to countless year one and two students and they all rave about their ICM instructors as if they are rock stars as well. I'm constantly amazed by the gifted faculty who have been recruited to participate in such a wonderful educational experience. Shout out to Dr. Arnie Mulder. Who knew such an astute internist can also perform open heart surgery? I'd like to leave you with one last story that illustrates your success in preparing the medical students for the wards. We admitted a woman with destruction le destructive lesions of her thoracolumbar spine. The main differential diagnosis included infection versus malignancy. The patient insisted on being updated at several hour intervals during the day. So the senior resident did what most senior residents would do in this situation and assigned her to the third year medical student on the team. On hospital day number seven, after two non-diagnostic bone biopsies, the neurosurgery service agreed to take her to surgery for an excisional biopsy. That morning, our medical student was having a group breakfast with Dr. Crandall, uh, which, he does, which he did for all medical students on rotation and therefore was not on morning rounds when we went to discuss the plan of care with the patient. Before I could finish my last sentence, she blurted out, I'm not going through with anything until I discuss the plan with Dr. David. I looked at the senior resident perplexed and she came over and whispered in my ear, you know, uh, David, our medical student. Of course, Dr. David will be by later this morning to speak with you. So again, um, it, it's wonderful to see everybody here that I know and that I don't know. I, I want to again thank you for all the dedication and the work you've done. It, you really have a legacy in the individuals that you've touched, and thank you. And and thank you, Greg, and everybody involved for allowing me to speak at this event. Thank you so much, Dr. Sapkin. Uh, so many emotions that come up as I hear you speak, and I think we all can relate to so many of those stories. So I would open it up to um, questions or uh, comments from the um, audience. I would like to uh, comment. I was uh, in the second year of ICM. I was admitted uh, to USC in 1971 in the medical school, and I was lucky to be in Doug Ford and Sid LaSalle's ICM group. And I'll never forget what Doug Ford told us early on when I was in ICM. He said, if you listen to your patients, they'll tell you what's wrong with them. And I've heard several of you say that. But then he went on and said, if you really listen to your patients, they'll tell you how to make them well. And that became um, a kind of guiding star for me in 45 years of medical practice. And I had a very satisfying and rich, wonderful experience with patients. I, was in, I went into family medicine and loved it. And I just retired and I'm just so grateful for having been in ICM and grateful for the fact that you're continuing this really, really valuable program. Uh, keep it up, keep up the good work, keep fighting those, those medical, those electronic records. Oh, <laughs> you gotta learn to make the medical record work for you. You don't work for it. And that, yeah. that was a tough, tough learning cliff, I would say. But anyway, thank you so much for this program. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for joining us and please and tell, tell us your name as well. Oh, I'm sorry, that's my wife's name on the screen. Uh, I'm Christopher Stanton, uh, class of 1975. Yeah, my wife's name came up. I didn't know how to change that. 
That's okay. Well, thank you for being with us and thank you for sharing. That's wonderful. Others that uh, have comments or questions? Can I tell a quick story? Sure. So I was actually a classmate of Chris's uh, in the class of 75. And um, I enjoyed ICM very much. Helen Kornreich, one of the starting members, was my year one instructor. But my story actually comes later on when I was recruited by Eric Cohn to be an instructor. And I just want to say what a special man he was. And I warned Dr. Harlan that if I tell this story, I might start crying. Um, in 1994, my, I think it was my second year teaching ICM, my son became ill with Crohn's disease. And it was a very difficult time for my wife and myself, obviously. And of course, our son, who was only 11 years old at the time. And uh, I had to take some time off and Eric said, don't worry about it. We will cover you. I will take care of your group. And I only missed maybe one or two weeks. I can't remember exactly what happened, but we I don't remember the specific circumstances. <laughs> the next time I saw Eric, I couldn't believe the sight. I mean, he had lost a tremendous amount of weight. And I later found out, of course, that I'm sure many of you know that he was dying of AIDS. And to think that in my moment of trauma, that in the bigger picture was so small that he gave so much of him has always meant so much to me. And I just wanted to say how much gratitude I have. I, I went to Eric's funeral and just, it was an amazing, all the love that was shown to him. He was a very special man and a very big part of this program. And I remember him coming to Westchester to recruit me to be an instructor. It was, he was just very, very special. I just wanna make sure everyone heard those words from somebody. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And yes, Eric Cohen plays a large part both on the campus and in ICM. Uh, really wonderful. I would like to comment. Um, I'm from the class of 74, so I'm one of the older people here. But I had these two wonderful women for year one and two of ICM. And besides being such a good, you know, instructor, what I really, really appreciated those women for is what a woman has to do to be a physician at that time. Because in my class, there was only 10 women in the class of 120 students. And I would, on top of that, I was the first Mexican female uh, to be there. So, you know, it was, it was a real struggle as a Mexican female in 1970 to came from a family that had no professional people in it. Um, these women were a real inspiration and I still love them and continue to connect with them after school. Um, I subsequently moved on to Chicago and then to San Francisco and then Santa Clara County. But I still remember to the students that I've taught over the years, quoting some of the things that these women shared with me about how to take a history, how to do a physical, how to pay attention because yeah, your patient's telling you what's wrong and how to get them better. So this was good to, 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 uh, to do this. Um, it was such a big part of my first two years. Um, so wonderful. Go ahead. Yeah, um, my name is Bob Friend, uh, class of 73, um, and started, I guess, the first year of ICM. 1969, 1970. And um, I, my instructor was Don Matern, who was a partner in orthopedic practice with Lawrence Stevens. And we actually had a lot of contact with his group as well. And I had some friends who were in Dr. Stevens' group. Um, and I just wanted to tell one thing that has always stuck with me and I thought so fascinating about the way Dr. Stevens um, completely practiced what he preached and really was singular in his honest exploration of where the ideas of ICM took him. Um, and one of those things, stories that he told was, and we had a joint meeting of our ICM group and his ICM group. And he talked about how he got interested in why uh, for the patients in their practice who had uh, lower back trouble, 
there were patients that they recommended surgery and there were patients they, they recommended bed rest and sometimes traction, so-called conservative measures. And what he and he looked at every different kind of factor and the ages of the patients versus the clinicians and blah, blah, blah. And he looked and to his absolute horror, he described to us medical students that what he realized was that it went by date, not date of anything except right before uh, April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, uh, and January 15th, that in the five days or six days before that, there was a surge of surgery recommendations. Now, those of you in private practice will know that those are the dates that quarterly uh, income tax payments are due. And anybody in private practice is aware of that, but very few think about what effect that has on their clinical judgment, their clinical decisions. He could find no rhyme or reason really, no difference in the pathology and so on of the patients that really explained why they would, you know, it was always a gut feel that, oh, I think this one will do better with, you know, conservative measures, but they made, you know, there was much more money to be made. And these were the most scrupulous, non, you know, uh, money grubbing uh, physicians I've ever met and not, and that they, I have not found uh, I don't know, I don't want to offend anybody who's an orthopedist, but I have not found that many orthopedists who were their equal in terms of humanity and so on. And uh, it, was, it was very eye-opening to me and I continue to be incredibly impressed with uh, them and their practice. And I think about it many, many times and have used some of their uh, maxims to me as a practicing child adolescent psychiatrist in my teaching of residents. And it's always been very useful to uh, think of this. I'm still friends with a couple of my classmates from those days, you know, close friends. And uh, I must say, it's a little disappointing that so far there's one other rep, one other person who has answered uh, whether there's anybody else from the class of 73 and we've been oh. carrying on a delightful oh. side chat. So thanks very much. Oh, good. Well, thank you for sharing that. Now I know Dr. Tony Kerner, I'm not sure if he was gonna be able to join, but he was close in uh, that year era and is currently teaching, but wonderful. But I also appreciate Dr. Reese, you mentioned Eric Cohen and uh, we have as one of our next speakers is um, Dr. Netta Rusta Black who won the Eric Cohen Award uh, about eight years ago, which he graduated. And Eric Cohen, after his um, passing, his estate, they uh, established an award um, to honor a student who really embodies the uh, ideals of ICM. And Dr. Black uh, received her medical degree, obviously from Keck, and then where she was valedictorian, and then went on to um, become a uh, dermatologist. And um, after graduating from here, um, went on to serve as chief resident and then did a specialty in dermatopathology, University of Colorado. So she's now practicing locally. We're very excited to have her back and we'd love to hear some comments from a previous Eric Cohen winner. So um, Dr. Black, thank you. And we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Harlan for that really nice introduction. Um, I was lucky enough to be a medical student at Keck from 2008 to 2012. I see two of my classmates, um, you know, attending this Zoom call. And it was such an incredible time to be a medical student because we were able to witness the transfer of patients from that iconic old county hospital that we could all see from the freeway to the brand new state of the art LA County USC Medical Center, as Dr. Worley was mentioning. Um, actually, my first several ICM encounters were done at the Old County Hospital, and I remember feeling so nervous as a first-year medical student in that bright white, crisp, short medical coat, walking with our instructor through those big county hospital doors and getting past security and the metal detectors to walk down that super long hallway 
where you enter the elevators that could take you to sort of all different floors. It was sort of unpredictable. And we went up to the patient rooms and the patients at County, both at the old hospital and the new were just so gracious. And they gave us all the time in the world to ask our questions and to practice our exam. And they even thanked us at the end of our visit as medical students, when we should have been the ones thanking them for teaching us so much. Those were experiences I will never forget. And now I have a cousin at the Keck School of Medicine and just hearing his stories as a medical student, a third year medical student now, it just makes me feel that Keck and USC are the best places to, uh, the best place really to train as a physician. When I graduated from medical school, I was a dermatology resident at LA County. I just did not want to leave. And I continued to use the skills that the ICM program taught me. Believe it or not, we had a Hansen's disease or a leprosy clinic at LA County where we saw a couple hundred patients who had the disease or were suffering the sequelae of the disease. And the director at that time was Dr. Thomas Ray, who has since passed, um, and he embodied the values of ICM. He emphasized the need for these patients to be touched since their disease was so stigmatizing. We shook these patients' hands. We embraced them when they were distraught by their diagnosis. And in many ways, it was the most important part of their care. As a clinician now, I'm so grateful to the ICM program at Keck. Physicians today, I think as many people have sort of um, discussed already today, are practicing during a time when revenue and reimbursements are emphasized in patient care. We're required to use that dreaded electronic medical record and spend so much of our time charting, sometimes even during a patient encounter. But I have to say that the emphasis on patient-centered care by the ICM program has really given me the skills to be a good doctor, as cliche as that sounds. Um, I can recall just two examples during this COVID-19 pandemic as a practicing dermatologist. I have several patients who have been seeing me a little bit more frequently during the last few months. Um, one in particular comes to mind and I'll call him John. He's in his 80s. I've been caring for him and his wife for the last few years and he's been coming to see me about every two weeks with a new lesion to show me and I keep reassuring him that the spot is benign. Just last week, he came in for a bruise on his chest, and I told him, it's just a bruise. It's going to be okay. But every time he comes in, I sit down. We talk about his wife, who's suffering from Alzheimer's dementia. We've cried together as he explains the difficulty in being her caretaker, the difficulty, as he says, quote, of seeing the love of your life for the last 70 years, not remember what she told you yesterday. Those, uh, I think 14 out of the 15 minutes of my encounter with him each time has nothing to do with dermatology at all, but I know that you know we've taken good care of him. Another example are some hospital consults that um, I sometimes see at Huntington Hospital. This patient was a 19 year old college student and she was admitted for a condition called erythema multiforme, which is this immune system reaction to a virus where you get severe ulcerations in the mucosa, so severe that she wasn't able to eat or drink. She was terrified and alone because visitors right now, um, or then a few weeks ago at Huntington, were not allowed to visit due to COVID-19. So the primary team called me on a Saturday night. I put my son to sleep. I went to the hospital to see her and her diagnosis was very straightforward and I reassured her and told her about the treatment but I could tell she was so scared and she, her parents were scared because they couldn't be there with her. She was just 19. So I sat with her on that Saturday night and we talked about what she's majoring in and how weird it is to attend college through Zoom. And we even talked about this new great show on Netflix that we've both been watching. And I felt better leaving her room after the 30 minutes. And I think she felt better too. So, I would really like to thank the ICM program and all these mentors that I'm seeing today and you know, for making me a better physician and a better person. And I wanna thank the ICM uh, program as well for introducing me actually to five of my best friends. We actually had a Zoom reunion call a few weeks ago and the six of us were randomly placed in an ICM group on the very first day of medical school and we bonded so much because of the rich experiences at Keck and the rich experiences through ICM. We've cried together, we've laughed together, we suffered together and we've celebrated together. And now 12 years after meeting, the six of us are like family. 
And I actually put together a couple pictures to show you sort of how we've kept in touch. I don't know if someone's able to put those up. Oh, perfect. Okay, so we were ICM group number 22. And can you go to the next slide, please? This is um, at my wedding and we're holding up twos for 22. So these are, this is the six of us when, in 2012, next. We've climbed Mount Whitney together and trained even as you know residents with busy schedules and next. I've attended all of their weddings, next. I've held their babies, multiple of them, three of them, next. We've ran triathlons together. This was in March 2020, right before COVID sort of uh, caught, I think the first week in March, right before the shutdown. Next. And I think the most special part to me, my son, Oliver, and my ICM mate's daughter are best friends. They're in the same preschool and they see each other every day. So thank you to everyone here and to ICM for really changing my life and, and making me a better physician and a very happy person. I'm so happy to be part of this group. Thank you so much, Dr. Black. Um, it's really heartwarming just to think about all the patients that you literally touch, but um, just knowing that you have this amazing um, training that really prepared you. I mean, you're really uh, changing the lives of thousands of people. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And we love your connection with your classmates. May I speak at this time? Maybe I'm going to do one more introduction and then um, I'll give you a chance. Thank you. Thank you for asking though, yeah. Um, so our last presentation is uh, we're going to award the Marvin E. Dawn um, ICM Faculty Award. And uh, this is an award that every year the second year students get to vote on their instructor um, who they think has uh, kind of embodies the ideals of an ICM instructor. And the award was put together by Marvin's uh, son, uh, Burl, and his wife, Nancy. And they're actually here today. I don't know, uh, Burl and Nancy, if you can wave or say hello, we can get you on the screen. I see you. Well, we'll get to them. Um, so the award was in um, Marvin. Don passed away eight years ago. He was a longtime ICM instructor. And oh, there they are. The Dons are in front. There you go. Uh, both uh, alumni from, uh, from Keck. And so Marvin passed away. And in order to honor him, um, Burl and Nancy decided to put together a fund to honor an uh, ICM instructor who's a longstanding instructor, well beloved by students who really um, embodies what Marvin stood for. And Marvin was a longtime instructor over 20 years in ICM and helped uh, worked a long time at Kaiser. It was one of the early founding members. And um, so today the award is given to Dr. Victoria Sitalowicz. So we call her Dr. V. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about Dr. Sitalowicz. Um, she graduated from the University of Oklahoma School of Medicine and then did internal medicine at Duke and became a nephrologist after that at University of Colorado. She's taught ICM for 23 years and she has received amazing comments. I wanted to read uh, one or two comments from a student. Dr. Sitalowicz is the best instructor I've ever had. Under her guidance, I experienced great personal and professional growth. She was a wonderful mentor, and I hope to one day be as wonderful a doctor, communicator, and teacher as she is. I think like Dr. Black said, I feel privileged to have Dr. V as my mentor. Another said, I have worked and volunteered for the last six years with dozens of physicians since becoming a medical student. And yet there are only two or three I would truly consider role models. And Dr. V is one of them. She embodies every value I cherish in a doctor. Integrity, honesty, focus, transparency, altruism, kindness, and grace. She deserves a teaching award and I nominate her for anyone that I can. So thank you, Dr. Sitalowicz. We are pri privileged to have you and wanted you to share a couple of words as well. Well, if I can, if I can wipe away the tears. <laughs> I, I did notice there's a Rachel Don in our group. Is that a relative to the Dons? Oh yes, so we have three of you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Harlan. Uh, 
and thanks especially to Dr. Marvin Don's family for creating a special way for our students to honor their teachers. Dr. Burl and Nancy, so glad you could be here today and Rachel, and please convey our deepest gratitude to your entire family for this gift, which honors that like his legacy. Gratitude is my word for today. One of the greatest hidden to me <laughs> wisdoms I've acquired since beginning with my USC ICM colleagues is that in teaching, I am the student. I learn more than my students and I take it all back to bettering my care of my patients. As a very concrete example, I think it was during Dr. Worley's uh, tenure that just in reviewing the neurologic and ophthalmologic exams with my students repeatedly, I honed my skills, took them back, and resulted in solving three unsolvable cases that occurred in a short time after that, two of which were brain tumors. No one knew. <laughs> so uh, my students' words, always inspiring to me, which you read today, Dr. Harlan, are humbling for it, it really is I who have been taught, guided, and generously educated by each of them through the years. I treasure my time with each through thick and thin. The future of medicine is and will be transformative. Many of our speakers have shown us where we've come from. I trust our USC students to be in the front of shaping the conversations, creating the policies, and having the breakthroughs we all need and want. And I know they will continue our profession's highest calling, regardless of what lies ahead. That is to care for our fellow human beings and be of service to them. At some point in our lives, we all ask ourselves, why am I here? For what purpose really? My lifetime commitment is to having health and well being for everyone with no one left out. And I continue to stand for having our healthcare delivery systems work for everyone with no one left out. And I remake my promise and commitment, which each of my students hears from me, that I'm committed to them becoming the best physicians they can be, not compared to anyone else just the best they can be and become. The possibilities are limitless for each of them. Thank you for the great honor of standing together to support our common purpose today. And thank you for this honor. Be safe, everyone. Thank you, Victoria. It's wonderful to see you. Wonderful award. And thank you to the Don family. It's such an honor every year to be able to recognize your father. And um, just really nice to see you as well. Thank you. So I, I would love to, you know, wrap up at this point and give a couple of my own closing thoughts. We just had, uh, gosh, what a, what a journey of uh, beginning with ICM and, and walking through three of our past uh, ICM directors. You've heard from some of their you know, wonderful moments, some of the challenges, but really appreciative to them for kind of keeping ICM alive, growing and changing. I also wanted to thank uh, some people individually. So Dr. Joe Marie Riley has served as the associate ICM director for the last 13 years and recently transitioned to um, head up the primary care initiative for our school and she worked really closely with myself and with Dr. Worley. Also Dr. Win May, who is the director of our Clinical Skills Education and Evaluation Center. She's been a personal mentor to me and just a wonderful person and knew personally many of the folks who were mentioned tonight uh, continues to be heavily involved in our students. Also to Dr. Maureen Logan, who is our assistant director for ICM, is celebrating her 23rd year with the ICM program and started as a medical student educator and continues to keep our students at the, the center of the attention. Some of our wonderful staff, Suzanne Brody, who I saw your name on there, who left us after 25 years up to Oregon 
and um, remembered me as a student and got to then uh, continue chiding me as the director. So I appreciate that, Suzanne. And LT Ramirez, who is uh, 13 years with the ICM program as well. But you know, it really takes a team beyond just the ICM office. We have incredible support in medical education. And thank you so much to Dr. Don Elliott for just amazing uh, guidance and leadership and has taught me a ton personally and really led our department. And we work really closely with the AV teams, everyone in financial aid, Office of Diversity and Inclusion, uh, student affairs, admissions, you know, it's part of our wonderful Keck family. Um, so thank you to everyone who made this happen. And especially I wanted to recognize Molly Gervais, who is an amazing partner in this. And you know, I could just is uh, amazing. Someone asked about the pin on my jacket earlier and that was uh, in a role I served representing the Keck School of Medicine to the board of directors at the main campus. And Molly was the one who found me and um, introduced me to that role. And she is an amazing person who is really, um, you know, has done so much to promote Keck and to put tonight's event on. So wanted to take a big moment to recognize Molly and all the hard work to bring this together. And finally, our amazing faculty who have been mentioned that are currently teaching and are really the lifeblood of taking those groups of six, like Netta mentioned, and gelling them together, teaching them, taking them to the bedside. Um, and I see many of you on the, the Zoom call today. If any of you are interested in teaching or wanting to come back to teach, please reach out to me. Um, I'll put my information in the chat uh, box as well, but we always love having our alumni come back and um, yeah, we, we would love to have you involved. And I think finally to the parents, I was so pleased to see that there's so many parents on this call who are interested and we are so touched to be able to care for your children. I know they're grown children and they're becoming, they're adults. Uh, you may think they still act like children at times, but we're teaching them to become physicians. And it's something that all of us really have dedicated our lives to doing. And I agree with Dr. V that it's something that we, when we go home at the end of the day, uh, that's where we get our joy is taking your children and we learn from them. So thank you for entrusting us with your children to become wonderful physicians. You hear my dog telling me that's enough talking. So I think with that, uh, we will open up the chat and keep the uh, discussion going. So there will be open, open mic night, I guess. Um, and please feel free, but thank you all for joining. And uh, follow up Marshy. Well, uh, you can hear me. Yes, now please share your story and introduce yourself. First of all, I think I'm the oldest member of this activity. When I saw the title, it really intrigued me. I started at USC Medical Center in September of 1956. If there's anyone on the, on the group that's been here longer than that, uh, all the best to you too. Now, it's on Thursday afternoon, the first Thursday when I was a medical student, they took us to the old county hospital, the big gray mother on the hill. And they just took us to the seventh floor, which was the medical floor and said, here is a patient, go sit down and talk to them. They didn't say what we were going to talk about. We didn't have anything to, to do. We weren't doing anything that was specifically medical. They just wanted us to sit by a patient and talk with them. Well, at that time, and I don't think it's lasted too long, I was fairly shy, but I sat down and I talked to this man. <coughs> and it was an experience that I'm happy to share with you because it only endorses everything that's been said here, except for the fact that it didn't begin in 1960 or 70 or 80. It began in the 50s. And I am sorry that it wasn't emphasized and carried out. If 65 years of experience in medicine is worth anything that can be 
this, uh, that can be condensed into one word, it's think. I've been through all the issues of the electronic medical record. I was a member of the faculty of the school in the, in the late uh, 60s and 70s. Uh, I started programs that are still in existence. Uh, I saw the, the, uh, ho the hospital torn down. I saw Keck, be do Keck uh, School be uh, constructed. And I can only tell you that the more you do to let your students think, the better they're going to do. Uh, I hope that uh, you, you continue to emphasize this very wonderful program because if there is anything that disappoints me about my medical education, it was that we didn't have an ongoing um, emphasis on interacting with your patients so that you know who they are, they know who you are, and then you can always be the third medical, third year medical student in the program whom the patient thinks is really their doctor. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Oh, great. Thank you so much for sharing that. And re remind me of your name. Daniel Wiseman. Daniel. All right. Thank you so Our much. Pediatric respiratory program, the blood gas analysis that is still going on there. The uh, mm -hmm. programs that were for the pediatric pavilion, which was alive at that time, and for the uh, uh, OBGYN, because uh, we had a very large newborn service that needed a lot of blood gas. And so that's, that's what I left you in the, <laughs> Wonderful. In the hospital. And then I went out into practice for many years. Wow, we're so, so appreciative. Thank you so much for sharing that as well. <laughs> Others that would like to comment, any sharing? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, I'm El Sarno. I'm a, a graduate of the School of Medicine 1981 and uh, had a military career, been in practice now for nearly 40 years, um, enjoyed every minute of it, um, all beginning a course there at, at USC. Um, medical practice has changed so much in the 40 years. And of course, you know, not only the medical record, but now we're suddenly embroiled in this situation where uh, reimbursement to hospitals is really tied to patient experience. And so suddenly institutions are very interested in how people are able to interact with their patients and how you get these great press gamey uh, surface back and scores and how that's now, you know, really um, tied to reimbursement. So uh, interestingly, uh, over the last couple of years, some of these committees have been formed in my institution whereby they're, they're wondering how people get these great press any scores. <clears throat> and of course, for years I've led our department and our division in those press any scores. Uh, they didn't mean very much in the last you know, 10, 15 years, but now they're very meaningful because again, money is tied to it. So when somebody comes by and says, well, how do you get those great scores? You know, what do you do? What's, what's the process? And I simply think back to what I learned in ICM. You, know, you go in, you introduce yourself to the patient. Uh, Pre-COVID, you would shake their hand. You would shake the hand of everybody in the room. You would sit down and look them in the eye. You would, you would engage with them, ask them about how they're doing. Uh, in these days when we have just a few minutes to spend with our patients, there's really an art to learning how to connect with the patient and let them know that you're really fully present for them. Um, it, it can be done and, and there's an art to it, but it, it's something that you have to spend some time working on it. And it can become very natural and very free flowing it doesn't have to be an artificial process. Uh, I always cringe when I go and see my own doctor and they walk in the room and they look at the wall and start typing and asking me questions with their back to me, which to me is immediate failure. Um, so I really wanna credit uh, ICM for teaching me how to talk to patients. My first uh, year instructor was John Link, hematologist, oncologist. He was out of Long Beach Memorial at the time and we loved going down there, my group and myself. Um, Engaging with cancer patients as a first-year medical student, I think, was uh, a really profound experience because what we were learning in, in the classroom uh, was really brought home when you actually saw somebody that was sick and ill and scared and not sure what was happening to them. Um, so it was really a gift for us to be able to engage with those folks. I remember many of those stories to, the, to this day. 
But I think the biggest gift was just being able to learn how to go in and engage with somebody and sit down and ask them about their lives and you know what was frightening them and give them some encouragement and give them hope. And that's something that I practice to this day. So again, thanks to all the folks from ICM for teaching me how to do that. Um, the stories that I'm hearing from everybody else really just reinforce um, how true to that ideal the ICM program has been. And I applaud you and hope that you um, really continue that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Burl Don and my wife Nancy. We're here up in uh, Northern California. And uh, first, we'd like to congratulate. I, I, I don't want to, I'm very sensitive to people's names. So I want to congratulate Dr. V right, <laughs> on your award. I, I'm very, as a uh, fellow nephrologist, I'm very happy to went to another nephrologist. <laughs> I always like to think that as nephrologists, we are the consummate internist or the quintessential physician, but there are others on this panel who uh, may be debatable. But we're very happy to you, for you and that, and to honor my father. I really appreciate all the work you've done in teaching medical students. And we're very happy to be a small part of this uh, program. And uh, I think under great, great leadership of Dr. Harlan, I think continue on. I think we're very excited uh, your uh, USC School of Medicine. Thank you. The keck. I was USC, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Anyone else who'd like to? Share something or comments? I can't believe I haven't heard one comment about the Dodgers quite yet. <laughs> Only my students, I will tell you today, were going through congratulating me on the Dodgers win. <laughs> so I know they know I love the Dodgers and I thought that they, they cute that they felt I had a hand in the, uh, the World Series victory. Some of us root for the Red Sox. <laughs> And I didn't tell you that Dr. Elliott was a nephrologist too, uh, Burl. But yes, I agree. The nephrologists seem to always uh, figure out how to uh, sort things out just right. I can, uh, when I was in ICM, if you want to hear it. All right, let's do one or two more stories and then we'll wrap. I had a story about when I was in ICM. Um, my first rectal exam, do you think you're ready for that one? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know. It looks like Dr. Allen wants to say something. <laughs> <laughs> I will defer. <laughs> we, we do have some parents, you know, non, non physicians. Let's hear from Dr. Allen if he was going to say something. Dr. Allen, are you going to share, share a story? Yeah, how, do I, how do I do that? Just talk. All right, I'm talking. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I graduated in 1965, so uh, uh, I was before the official ICM. I understand it did begin in 1958, but I do have a, a baseball-related uh, experience in the fact that uh, although it was 58 years ago, I do recall my experience with ICM or with, uh, with our experience. We went to John Wesley Hospital and interviewed uh, patients. They weren't uh, fascinating patients. They were mostly there for alcoholic rehab. But my, um, my first experience there uh, was at the beginning of the World Series so that the patient I was interviewing had his little television in front of him and he wasn't really too receptive as to the questions I was asking him. And, uh, he was really kind of bored with, uh, with my, uh, my uh, approach to uh, his medical problem. So uh, that was, uh, I think, probably a failure as far as he was concerned, but uh, 
it was an it was it was a, a beneficial experience as far as I was concerned. Wonderful, thank you. And I do see in the chat uh, some comments from parents as well. And I know that it's a really hard choice to choose where you're going to go to medical school. And I even saw one of the instructors commented on choosing UCSF, or excuse me, choosing USC over UCSF. And um, we've had several students who have turned down other schools, some of which may be seen as more prestigious. And they nearly always come and tell me, I'm really glad I chose Keck. And I personally believe that, that ICM has a large, uh, a large role in that. I was the uh, I was that uh, student who chose USC over UCSF, and I'm so glad I did that. I have a story to tell about my very first ICM patient. I went and we were meeting at Rancho Los Amigos Hospital. I was in with Dr. LaFord and Dr. LaSalle, and I went in to see my first patient. And he was a young man who had gotten drunk, and he dived into a uh, lake that was more shallow than he thought or than he had realized and he broke his neck and he was paralyzed from the neck down and I went in to see him and the first thing that I said to him after I heard the story about why he was at Rancho was oh you, you should be lucky that you're alive and he turned to me and gave me this look like you don't have a clue and I realized then, I already knew I had a lot to learn in medical school, but then I knew I, I had a hell of a lot to learn in medical school. And it was a very humbling experience. And I remember going back to Dr. Ford and talking about it. And he said, you've just got to stay open, you know, and, and it was just wonderful. I mean, a, a wonderful learning experience. Wonderful. All right, well, I think maybe with that, we'll, uh, we'll adjourn. So nice to see everybody, see all of your faces and uh, so many familiar faces. We look forward, we probably can't wait another 10 years, Molly, to do a celebration. So we'll have to figure out a way to celebrate uh, sooner than every decade. But thank you all really for joining and please reach out to us um, if you have questions. I put my email in the chat and um, yeah, just thank you to our speakers, Dr. Savkin, Dr. Black, Dr. Victoria, Dr. Strom, Dr. Worley, Dr. Schaff, Dr. Elliott. And thank you again, Molly, for putting on this great event. Thank you, Dr. Harlan, for all you do for this program. Fight on. I agree. Thanks, Dr. Harlan. Thanks to everyone. <laughs>